Lord God, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for this year as we were looking back at it on um, Friday. It's so exciting, all that you've done um, amongst, amongst us this year. I thank you for the incredible privilege it's been to study this amazing book of Romans, Lord, and I ask that you would help us to finish it today, but more importantly, to learn, to hear from you as, we're, as we study the final, um, final parts of it this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, as I said, I think it's somewhat something to celebrate because we've been going at this for a long, long time. Year and a half. We started in May last year with Romans, our introduction to Romans. And since then, we've spent 41 Sunday mornings working through it. And today will be our 42nd and hopefully, well, it has to be our last one because there's no more youth until next February. So, quick recap of where we've been. Chapters 1 and 2, Paul basically laid out this problem, right? That is, man is sinful, and that there is no way that we can be justified. What does that mean? Declared righteous. There's no, so the idea is you're standing before a judge, and he's either going to declare you guilty or innocent, righteous. And Paul's point is nobody is going to be declared righteous or innocent according to God's law. And the point he makes in those first two chapters is, well, obviously, if you're, if you're like, if you're overtly, clearly sinful, you've got a problem. But even if you look kind of righteous, you've still got a problem. Even if you're really religious, it doesn't fix the problem. And even if you're a righteous looking religious Jew, Still no, no, no solution, right? You're not going to be declared righteous based on God's law. And so this is a problem. And so chapter three, he gave the answer to that problem. God offers us a different way to be, be righteous, not based on our works, not based on how we live our life perfectly according to his law. But if we trust him, if we have faith in him, he will declare us righteous on the basis of our faith. It's great point he made in chapter four is it's not actually a new idea that that's the only way that anybody has ever been saved and he gave the example of abraham who believed god and it was credited to him as righteousness that abraham wasn't declared righteous because he was this amazing perfect human being abraham was declared righteous because he trusted god he believed him yeah and so basically what Paul was showing in that chip, chapter 4 is that, that the entire book, that the whole Bible, Old and New Testament, is one message, consistent from beginning to end to the finest detail. Yeah? Uh, and so then, okay, then chapter 5, Paul talked about like the consequences of this justification by faith. And he said... It means we have peace with God. It means we can have joy in spite of suffering and that we can have hope regardless of our circumstances. And he also said that the, this grace that's given to us, this righteousness by faith, the grace is infinite, that there's nobody who's too sinful for this kind of justification. Right? That however much sin there is, God's grace can extend even more. Cool. But then that raises the question, and this was Paul's question, does that mean it doesn't matter what you do? Can we go on sinning so that grace may abound? And Paul's answer was, absolutely not. And so chapter 6 and 7, Paul's focus shifts from our justification, how we're going to be declared righteous, to our sanctification, which is being made righteous. And so that's the point that Paul makes here. It's like, fine, you're justified. You're going to be declared righteous, but that's just the start. Now you've, you've just crossed the starting line, right? But God has way, way grander plans for you than that. He actually wants to make you like Jesus. 
And so that's the point he makes in chapter six and seven is that God is trying to make us into the kind of person who can actually be happy in his presence. And he did that by setting us free from the power of sin and by setting us free from judgment according to the law. But do you remember how chapter 7 ends? No? He says, I keep doing the things I don't want to do and not doing the things that I want to do. A wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Yeah? He talked about this battle inside of him between his mind and his heart that loves God and wants to serve him and his body that loves sin and wants to serve it. And he basically says, in his own efforts, this whole sanctification thing, hopeless, right? Complete despair. But that then brings us to chapter 8, where Paul says, well, firstly, you can't be condemned because the law is gone for you. But secondly, the way that you're justified, the way that you're sanctified is not by trying really hard in your own strength. The only way to be justified is through the power of the Spirit, God's Spirit in you. And so chapter 8 is all about that, about the fact that as children of God, He has given us His Spirit to enable us to become more like Him, to be conformed into the image of His Son. Cool. And then chapter 8 finished with that like glorious, who can separate us from the love of God? Absolutely nothing. Yeah, cool. But then Paul shifts in chapters 9, 10, and 11 to like, okay, fine, those are great promises, but God made great promises to Israel too. And at the moment, it kind of looks like he's breaking those promises to Israel. And that's a problem, because if God doesn't keep his promises to Israel, why do we think he'd keep his promises to us? And so Paul's focus in these three chapters is explaining what actually is going on with Israel. And chapter 9, he said, basically, don't worry, like, this hasn't caught God by surprise. This was always a part of his plan, and he said that this would happen. Chapter 10, he explains what the actual problem is, which is Israel have refused the righteousness that comes by faith, and they are still trying to be righteous themselves. So it's their own decisions, their own choices that have put them into where they are. But chapter 11, Paul says, even though Israel reje have rejected God and rejected Jesus, God hasn't rejected them. Ultimately, he is he's allowed them to fall for a time so that we could be saved. But ultimately, God is going to save Israel and he is going to fulfill all of his promises to them. Cool. So that then was chapter 11. And then over the last four weeks five weeks today, we've been looking at these last chapters, which is Paul then saying, okay, well, given all of this theory, how should we live? What should this look like in our lives? In chapter 12, he said, we should, we should, con we should think of ourselves as living sacrifices, which he said is kind of like a contradiction, right? Because a sacrifice is dead. But we're supposed to be constantly dead. <laughs> what, what, how does that work? To ourselves, yeah. And that's Jesus said, if you want to save your life, you need to lose it, right? You're dead to our own, our own desires and, and, and uh, the things that we want to do. Those are dead. We're living for Jesus, doing the things that God wants us to do. So he said... Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He said, don't think too much of yourselves. We're all members of one body. We all have important jobs to do. Nobody's better or worse than anybody else. And we all need to do our job because what's a body with, if you haven't got eyes, you're blind. So if all the body parts need to be doing their jobs. Then he says, we mustn't pay evil for evil or take revenge. Because revenge is God's job. He says, we are supposed to overcome evil with good. Yeah. Chapter 13, he said, okay, uh, we, need to, we need to obey those who are in charge of us. Why? Because God put them there. 
So as long as they're not commanding us to do something that is sinful, essentially, that's, that's forcing us not to obey God, we need to obey them. We need to pay our taxes. We need to be good citizens. Yeah, sucks. <laughs> and then he says something quite hard. He says, don't owe anybody anything except... That's what we mustn't, we mustn't be like, we need to do those things so that we don't owe them because we've done them. But he says, don't owe anybody anything, anything except to love them, right? Love is the only thing we should owe anybody, according to Paul. And in chapter four, he talks about what that love looks like. So what is love? Sorry? And an act of what? What is it? Putting someone, above yourself. Putting somebody else ahead of yourself, right? It's self-sacrificial. That's the agape love that the Bible talks about. It's putting others ahead of yourself. And in chapter 14, Paul said, we should especially do that with Christians, with other believers. And the sort of situation that he talked about are these like differing opinions. Basically, where there are things where not everybody agrees, we need to treat each other with love, which means putting others ahead of ourselves. So he says, if you are very strict in terms of the rules that you follow, don't judge those who are less strict. And if you're less strict, don't look down on those who are more strict. He says, if you have convictions about something, then don't do them. It's a sin for you to do them. But don't put your convictions on others. And if you don't have convictions about something, but you know that somebody you love, somebody who Christ died for, does, then don't do those things around them. Put them ahead of yourself, right? Love them, okay. Uh, and then, and then he, when we went to chapter 15, the first half of chapter 15, he gives the ultimate example of this death to self, putting others ahead of yourselves, the person we're supposed to model ourselves on, which is, Ultimate example of love, Jesus, yeah. So he said, Jesus is the example. He put others ahead of himself. Um, he became a servant to those who hated him. And he said that we should receive others the way that Jesus received us. Which is, how did Jesus receive us? As we are, yeah, with all of our weaknesses and failings. Cool. All right. So let's finish chapter 15. Does somebody want to read this? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, but I myself am fully convinced about you, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But I have written more boldly to you on some points so as to remind you, because of the grace given to me by God, to be a minister of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, sorry, to the Gentiles. I serve the gospel of God like a priest, so that the Gentiles may become an acceptable offering, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so he starts off, I think the first thing that's quite useful is, is it like reminds us who Paul is writing to, right? He says, I'm convinced about you, my brothers and sisters, that you are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Just very flattering, right? Mm. Back in Romans 1, Paul said that he was writing to those who were loved by God in Rome, called to be saints, and that he thanks God through Christ Jesus for them because their faith is proclaimed throughout the whole world. So again, these are Paul is writing to believers, not unbelievers. Yes, quite clearly. And even more than that, these are apparently believers who are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and able to instruct one another, which I don't feel like you say that about me uh, or us, full of goodness. But with that said, we all have the Spirit of God in us, which means in a sense we are all filled with goodness and knowledge. Whether we make use of that, it's a completely different question. Um, 
But anyway, so these are who Paul's writing to. And he says that he has written more boldly to them on some points. And Paul certainly did write quite boldly to the Romans. In Romans 2, he said, Therefore, you are without excuse, whoever you are, when you judge someone else. For on whatever grounds you judge another, you condemn yourself because you who judge practice the same things. It's pretty harsh. Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. In Romans 9, he said, God has mercy on whom he chooses to have mercy and he hardens whom he chooses to harden. You will say to me, why does he find fault then? Well, for who has ever resisted his will? And Paul says, but who indeed are you, a mere human, to talk back to God? In Romans 11, he said, Don't be arrogant, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, perhaps he will not spare you. Romans 13, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except by God's appointment and the authorities that exist have been instituted by God. So the person who resists such authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will incur judgment. So again, quite quite harsh, quite bold, the things that Paul said to them. But I think the idea here is that, and we we see that uh, a little bit later as well, I think the idea is that Paul knows that these believers actually are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Um, And so, he's not actually accusing them of doing these things. Rather, he's reminding them of things that they already know right? Um, And are already doing. And I sort of think like, I don't know if this is a good analogy, but I like hassle my friends about things, make jokes, and hassle them. But I don't hassle them about things that are actually true. I don't call, like, I call them lazy because they're not actually lazy. If they were really lazy, I wouldn't, I might say, like, seriously, you're lazy, you need to fix, you know, whatever. But I'm not going to make jokes and laugh at them about it. You know what I mean? Like, it's because it's not true that you can say that. And I kind of think that's what Paul's getting at here is like, I've written to you more boldly. Like, I felt comfortable doing this because I know it's not actually true for you. Yeah? So I felt comfortable using that boldness to make a point that I wasn't going to offend you because I know that, yeah, that kind of makes sense. That's sort of what I think is going on. Um, but I guess it's worth noticing that studying the Bible, there are like two purposes. One is to learn things you don't already know. And we do lots of that. I do lots of that. But there is a second point, which is to remind you of things that you actually do know, but you've maybe forgotten or haven't thought about for a while. And that's sort of what point uh, Paul's doing says he's doing here, is I've written to you more boldly on some points, so as to remind you about things you actually already know. Okay. Uh, And then he uses this analogy of a priest. He says, I serve the gospel of God like a priest so that the Gentiles may become an acceptable offering. And so you basically have this picture of Paul acting as a priest. We're the the sacrifice. (laughs) And he's like helping the Holy Spirit prepare us and sanctify us to make us an acceptable offering to God. That's the picture. Then, let me read. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, go. Okay. So I boast in Christ Jesus about the things that pertain to God, for I will not dare to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in order to bring about the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. In the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit of God, so from Jerusalem even as far as I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, and in this way I decide to preach where Christ has not been named, so as not to build on another person's foundation, but that as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. Okay, so Paul starts by saying, I boast in Christ Jesus. Right, and the Bible is quite clear about boasting. Proverbs 27 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you don't know what a day might, may bring forth. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, What do you have that you did not receive? 
And if you received it, why do you boast as though you did not, right? Everything's given to you by God. So don't boast about it. Look what I've achieved, what I've done, right? You've received it. Don't boast about it. Jeremiah, God says, wise people should not boast that they are wise. Powerful people should not boast that they are powerful. Rich people should not boast that they are rich. So again, very clear. Don't boast. But then God says, if people want to boast... They should boast about this, that they, they should boast that they understand and know me. They should boast that they know and understand that I, the Lord, act out of faithfulness, fairness, and justice in the earth, and that I desire people to do these things, says the Lord. So, the one thing you can boast about is... Sorry? Yeah, knowing and understanding God, right. And, and so Paul takes that approach. In Galatians, he says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And so that's essentially what Paul went on, like says here is, I boast in the things that Jesus Christ has done through me. And here Paul gives something that he actually can boast about, which is that, Jesus has used him to preach the gospel in all its fullness from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, something like that. Which is not a bad effort for somebody traveling on foot. And then Paul gives, tells us like essentially what his main motivation is, why he's been so made, motivated to pe preach through that entire region. And it says that I desire to preach where Christ has not been named. So he wanted to go where nobody else had gone before to speak to people who had never heard the name of Jesus before. Just quite cool. And there are still people like that believe it or not, in this world, who have never heard of Jesus before. I heard about an Indian missionary who would go into these villages and say, do you know Jesus? And apparently people would say to him, uh, I don't think he lives here, but maybe in the next village. So we can still be a poor if you're, if you're interested in, in doing something like that. We had this group, uh, Ethnos Missions, come and speak like age, a while ago, a year and a half ago, and they're bonkers like you spend four or six years or something learning language not learning a language but learning how to create a language a written language so that you can go to some random tribe where nobody even can speak their language learn what their language means and figure out how to translate the bible into that language just crazy but amazing anyway so this is what Paul wanted to do. And we'll see in a sec. He says, this is the reason why I was often hindered from coming to you. And all the way back in um, Romans 1, Paul said, God, whom I serve in my spirit in the gospel of his son, is my witness that I continually remember you, the Romans, and always ask in my prayers, if perhaps now at last I may succeed in visiting you according to the will of God. So his desire, he says, he's constantly praying to God, please let me go and visit the believers in Rome. But he said, and he says, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you and that we can be mutually comforted by one another's faith, both yours and mine. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I often intended to come to you and was prevented until now so that I may have some fruit even among you, just as I already have among the rest of the Gentiles. And then he had this thing, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, the wise and to the fools. Thus, I am eager to preach the gospel to you. And I'm like, which are they? It's not clear to me. Is he calling them the wise or is he calling them the fools? I don't know. Anyway, but there was this strange passage where he said he was prevented He's been prevented until now from coming to Rome. And there, I said there was this other passage in Acts where Luke says that they went through the region of Fergia and Galatia, having been prevented by the Holy Spirit from speaking the message in the province of Asia. Then when they came to Mycenae, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to do this. 
So they passed through Mycenae and went to Troas and Sidon. It's quite strange. Like, I have no idea what that means. How did the Holy Spirit prevent them from going one place or from another place? (laughs) Maybe. One of the ways is by, was this, that Paul was, basically, there there were people who needed to hear from Paul more than the Romans did, right? He wanted to preach to those who had never heard before. And like, like he's just said, he knows that the Romans, the Roman believers are full of knowledge, able to teach one another. They don't really need him in the same way that these other people do. And so as long as there was an opportunity to preach to people who'd never heard of Jesus before, he felt called to stay there. Yeah? That's one of the ways that he was prevented. But now he says, there's nothing to keep me in these regions anymore. He's preached it, the gospel, fully, all the way from Jerusalem to Illyricum. And I've, for many years, desired to come to you when I go to Spain. For I hope to visit you when I pass through there, and that you will help me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a while. Well, Paul is now telling us his plans, right? He's teached in that whole region already. We think at the moment he's in Corinth. He has taught in this whole region in the east. Now he wants to go and preach in the west of the Roman Empire, which extends all the way up into England. And so he plans to go to Spain and he hopes that on his way through, he can stop off in Rome, spend some time with the believers there. They can maybe support him, probably financially, as well as in prayer and encouragement. And we send him off to Spain. And uh, it's possible that when he was in the East, Antioch was his like home base and the church that supported him, it's possible that he was hoping that Rome would be the home base for his new missionary journeys out in the West. Now, as we'll see, things didn't work out quite the way that Paul had planned. The person plans his course, but the Lord directs his steps. And that was Paul's plan, but God had his steps going in a different direction, which initially was to Jerusalem. And so that's what he says here. He says, but now I go to, Jer- to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia are pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do this, and indeed they are indebted to the Jerusalem saints. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are obligated also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, after I've completed this and have safely delivered this bounty to them, I will set out for Spain by way of you, and I, know that, and I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of Christ's blessing. So, this is what Paul says, and reading it now, knowing what comes, it's a little bit, it's kind of like when you're watching a movie, particularly about a true story, but maybe even a movie that you've seen before. And you know how the story ends. But you like find yourself hoping that maybe it'll end differently. And then you have that sinking feeling where you realize it can't and it won't. Yeah, It's kind of like that with Paul. He's saying all these great things. This is all the things I'm going to do. But we know that's not how the story ends. Like I said, for reasons we'll see in the next chapter, we believe that at this point in time, around about 58 AD, Paul was in Corinth. Uh, He had been in Ephesus, and then there were riots, and they wanted to kill him, and so he left. And he traveled up through a region called Macedonia, which is in the north of Greece, to Corinth. And then he spent three months in Corinth. And we think it was during those three months in Corinth that he wrote this letter to the Romans. Now, on his way through, the churches in Macedonia and also in what's called Achaia, which is the, it's this little region where Corinth is, they had made donations for the poor believers back in Jerusalem. And Paul explains the motivation for that. Basically, the Jews have shared their spiritual wealth with us. They've shared their Messiah with us. And so he says that they want to share some of their material wealth with the Jewish believers. 
which is, I think, something still worth thinking about because if you remember, God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and those who treat you lightly, I will curse. And um, yeah, it makes me cringe a little bit every time I see that New Zealand is like voted against Israel in the UN or something like that. I feel like you're asking for trouble. But anyway, they wanted they wanted to bless the Jews, the Jewish believers back in Jerusalem. Now, Paul had planned to sail from Corinth to Jerusalem to deliver this money that the churches in Macedonia and in the Corinth region had donated for the Jews in Jerusalem. But he then found out that the Jews, not the ones obviously not the believers, the other Jews had a plan to kill him on that boat journey. And so he changed his plan and he decided he would rather go back by land. And so he goes north um, to Philippi and he gets there in time for Passover and he spends Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread there. And then he jumps in a boat and sails to Troas and meets up with Timothy and some of the others and they join him. And then they all sail back to yeah, Caesarea, uh, Tyre actually, and then they travel down to Jerusalem. Um, and he, his goal was to get there in time for Pentecost, which is 49 days after Passover. So he was hoping after leaving there, within seven weeks, he'd be able to get to Jerusalem, which I think he ma- managed. Um, okay, so that was, that's what happened. Then he said, okay, now after I've completed this, after I've got back to Jerusalem, given this money to the Jews there, then... I'm going to set off for Spain by way of you. But, um, yeah, and he actually sounds quite confident. He says, I know that I, when I come to you, like he seems quite confident that he is actually going to end up in, in Rome, right? And it's possible that God had already told him this because he surely told him later when he was in prison in um, Jerusalem it says the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, have courage for just as you have testified about me in Jerusalem. So you must also testify in Rome. This is afterwards. This is after he wrote these words in Rome. But anyway, it's possible that God is here just confirming something that he had already showed Paul before is that you are going to go to Rome, but obviously not in the way that, well, things didn't go to, to plan or at least not to Paul's plan. Along the way, on his journey back to Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit and a whole lot of other people were warning Paul about what was coming. When he got to Miletus, it said, he, he, he told the other leaders there, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem without knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit warns me in town after town that imprisonment and persecutions are waiting for me but I do not consider my life worth anything to myself so that I may finish the task and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the good news of God's grace. So that's when he's in Miletus. Then he arrives in Tyre and it says that after we located the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. They repeatedly told Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. Then he traveled on to Caesarea. And while we remained there for a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea up but anyway, but it's elevated, so it's down. But he came to us, took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it and said, the Holy Spirit says this, this is the way the Jews in Jerusalem will tie up the man whose belt this is and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So God warned him anyway, but we understand that this is ultimately what God wanted him to be doing. Um, And that's basically what happened. Once they got to Jerusalem, the Jews... The Jews there saw Paul in the temple and they started a riot. They dragged him out of the temple and started beating him to death. When news reached the commanding officer, the Roman commanding officer, he rushed down with a whole bunch of soldiers and arrested Paul because he must have done something wrong, right? Like he must be the cause of all this rioting. And so he arrests Paul. When the Jews couldn't explain what Paul had actually done, the commanding officer told his soldiers to whip Paul until Paul told them what the deal was, what the problem was. And so Paul is literally like stretched out and they're about to whip him. And then he says to them, 
Is it legal for you to lash a man who is a Roman citizen without a proper, tr proper trial? It definitely was not. And so the soldiers and the commanding officer freak out a bit, and they're like, well, don't touch him. Um, they then decide that they will send, they should send Paul to Felix, who's up in Caesarea, and he's the governor of that region, the Roman governor. Uh, and Felix doesn't really know what to do with Paul either, and so he leaves him in prison for two years in Caesarea. Eventually, Felix is replaced by Festus, new governor, and the Jews in Jerusalem who have failed so far under Felix to get rid of Paul, they decide to try again under Festus two years later now, and so they lay new charges against Paul. Um, and they ask that Paul would be brought to Jerusalem to stand trial there. But they plan to assassinate Paul on the way. Paul knows their plan. It's something that they tried to do two years ago, and they've been trying to kill him ever since. And so when Festus asks Paul if he's willing to go to Jerusalem to stand trial, Paul says, I'm standing before Caesar's judgment seat where I should be trialed. I've done nothing wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. If then I am in wrong and have done anything that deserves death, I am not trying to escape dying. But if not one of their charges against me is true, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then after conferring with his counsel, Festus replied, you have appealed to Caesar, so then to Caesar you will go. The problem is Festus still doesn't really know what charges, what the charges are against Paul. Uh, and so when Herod Agrippa arrives from, I think, Jerusalem to uh, pay respects to this new governor, Festus explains the situation to him and asks whether maybe he could question Paul and figure out what's going on. Because he says, it seems unreasonable to me to send a prisoner without clearly indicating the charges against him, which is obviously true. After hearing Paul, Herod says, this man is not doing anything deserving death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. Um, yeah, and so after that, they send him to Rome to go and appear before Caesar. And when he eventually arrives in Rome, Luke writes, the brothers from there, these are the people he'd been writing to, right? This letter that we've been reading, when they heard about us, came from as far as the Forum of Appius, and three taverns to meet us. When we saw them, Paul thanked God and took courage. When we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. And so Paul then spent, well, yeah, he's come to Rome. Believers are really excited to see him, which is awesome. And uh, then it finishes. Paul lived there two whole years in his own rented quarters and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus with complete boldness and without restriction. And that's the last verse of Acts. And that's the last we know, really, in terms of the narrative of Paul's life. And we actually think that the book of Luke and the book of Acts, the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, may have been trial documents that it was like the systematic record of everything that had happened to bring Paul to be standing before Caesar. And that's then where it ends, is with him in Rome preparing to stand before Caesar. From this, okay, so then while he's there, while he's in prison in Rome, um, well, in house arrest in Rome, he wrote, or we believe he wrote his letters to the Ephesians, to the Philippians, to Colossians, the Colossians, and to Philemon during that time. From that point on, what we know about Paul's life is far more speculative. It's like just trying to join dots in history uh, and fill in the gaps. But this is what we think happened. After two years, he was released from his imprisonment in Rome, and he continued to preach and encourage the churches throughout the Mediterranean. And there is reason to think that Paul actually did make it to Spain because Clement, who was, it was the first bishop of Rome, or described that way, he wrote, after that, he had preached in the East and in the West. He won the noble renown, which was the reward of his faith, having taught righteousness unto the whole world and having reached the farthest bounds of the West. 
And so at least he made it to Spain. Some think he might even have made it up into Britain, Brittany. Uh, and when he had borne his testimony before the rulers, he departed from the world and went unto the holy place, having been found a noble pattern of patient endurance. And so, uh, yeah, so we think he actually traveled quite extensively. What we do know is that in 65 AD, so this is about seven years later, say, six, seven years later, he visited Crete, the island of Crete. And then the next, and then, no, sometime before that he went to Crete. And then in late 65 AD, so again, about six years later, he went to a place called Nicopolis in Macedonia. And uh, while he was there, Paul wrote his letter to Titus, who was on, back on Crete. So he letter, wrote a letter back to Titus. And he also wrote his first letter to Timothy, who was in Ephesus. Oops. It was in Ephesus. Shortly after that, Paul was back in prison in Rome. And we don't really know how he got there. What we do know is that in the next year, 66 AD, Caesar Nero right? This, the Emperor Nero, the Caesar at that time, he visited Nicopolis for the Actian Games. And he was a bit of a psycho and everybody was terrified of him. And so basically they rigged everything so that he won any tournament that he competed in from music to chariot races. And so it's possible, but com complete speculation, we don't know, but it's possible that Paul ran into Nero, when they were in Nicopolis together. Um, all we do know is that shortly after those games, Paul was back in prison in Rome. And this time, um, he was sentenced to death, which means his prison imprisonment probably ended in this prison called the Marmitine Prison, which was a... Um, it was originally built around 600 BC as a water system to be filled with water, but they ended up using it for a prison, particularly for like their most infamous prisoners and those who were condemned to death. And basically there were these circular rooms, stone rooms about seven meters in diameter, and you get lowered and they're obviously different levels and you get lowered through a hole into the level below until it's time for your execution, if you survive that long, and then you get hauled back out and executed. Um, and there's a tradition that both Paul and Peter were in this prison at the same time in the last days of their life. Paul and Peter. Around a year later, Paul was executed in Rome. Um, a whole bunch of ancient writers say that he was beheaded, probably by sword because that was considered more merciful way to die, which was reserved for Roman citizens, which Paul was. Um, Peter, though, was sentenced to crucifixion, and tradition tells us that he didn't feel worthy to, be, to die the same death of his saviour, and so that's why they, he had them crucify him upside down. Yeah. Um, now, legend has it, is legend i don't believe this but it's legend that when they crucified uh, when they beheaded paul his head bounced three times and each place that his head bounced a fountain appeared and so there's a church in rome called the church of saint peter uh, at saint paul church of saint paul at the three fountains and that traditionally is supposed to have been where paul was martyred um Paul's friends came and took his body and buried him in a tomb that belonged to a Roman lady called Matrona Lucilla. And about 300 years later, when Constantine is emperor and Rome has now become a Christian empire, so to speak, uh, he apparently went and built a church where Paul was buried. And they think at that point his remains were transferred into this marble sarcophagus, this marble, you know, uh, what do you call it? Buried coffin, essentially a marble coffin that has the um, the words Paul, apostle, martyr. Yeah, and so one can go and visit that today. In the meantime, 
Paul's letter to the Romans was apparently treasured by the believers in Rome, and some believe that his letter was memorized and probably read at like virtually every meeting that they had, the believers in Rome. They also think that a, uh, an edited version without all the personal messages, which we're going to get to soon, may have been distributed quite widely through the church as like a summary of Christian doctrine, because that's really what it is. This is amazing. Yeah. Yep, so that's how it actually went. But for now, Paul thinks he's heading to Spain. Uh, So then he says, Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit to join fervently with me in prayer to God on my behalf. Pray that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea and that my ministry in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. Now may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And so Paul clearly had some sense of the trouble that potentially lay ahead of him. Um, He was also worried that the disciples in Jerusalem might not approve of his ministry to the Gentiles or the way that he, the things that he had taught them. And so he asks the believers in Rome to please join with him in prayer. And the word that's translated um, fervently, join fervently is that sunagonizomai and it's made up of sun which is like with together in union and then agonizomai which is essentially it's where we get the word agony from but it's a struggle or fight and he's basically saying like fight with me in prayer right which is quite cool because as As Christians, we have the opportunity to fight in battles that are going on throughout the world, right? But from here in Auckland, which is quite cool, to join those who are suffering or, um, yeah, are out there fighting battles for Jesus. We can actually be a part of those battles through prayer because we're told our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world rulers of this dark, what? against the world, rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. And although we live as humans, we don't wage war according to human standards, for the weapons of our warfare are not human weapons, but are made powerful by God for tearing down strongholds. So we have different weapons. Main weapon is prayer. So Paul asked them to pray for two things that he would be rescued from those who were disobedient in in Judea, from the Jews in Jerusalem, and that his ministry in Jerusalem would be acceptable to the saints. Second one, definitely answered. It says, in Acts, Luke writes, when we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers welcomed us gladly. The next day, Paul went in with us to see James, and all the elders were there. When Paul had greeted them, he began to explain in detail what God had been what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard this, they praised God. Prayer answered. Cool. But what do we do with the rescue me from the disobedient, those who are disobedient in Judea? Did the believers in Rome maybe not pray hard enough? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that, uh, in fact, I think that Paul was rescued from the Jews in Judea because they didn't want him in prison writing letters to churches all over the place. They wanted him dead. And so they, when they found him in the temple, they dragged him out, tried to beat him to death. And then he was rescued by the Roman officer. The next day, or a couple of days later, They come up with this new plan. They're going to ask the commanding officer to bring Paul to the temple so that they can try give him a fair trial. But along the way, they're going to ambush him and kill him. And the main people who were like, the the, the guys who had come up with that plan actually made a vow to God that they would not eat or drink until Paul was dead. I don't know what happened, (laughs) but Paul wasn't dead. Not for quite a long time. And so what happened was uh, Paul's nephew happened to overhear them talking about this plan so he came to paul and said this is what they're going to do and so paul said take him to the commanding officer 
tell the commanding officer what you've just told me. And so he does. And so then instead of taking Paul to the temple, he that night sends him up to Caesarea with 400 soldiers and 70 horsemen. So anyway, so the point is, I think Paul actually was rescued from those in Judea who, who were not believers. Um, maybe not in the way that we might like and probably not in the way that Paul had in mind, but um, the fact is Paul survived and he went on to preach the gospel all over the Roman Empire and to write a whole bunch of letters that we still treasure today. So I think that, um, that, queer, that prayer was answered too. But then I think a slightly different question. He says, so that by God's will, I may come to you with joy. Do you think Paul came to Rome with joy? If you went through all of that, would you be joyous? I think it's all about attitude, right? And I think that Paul probably absolutely did come there with joy. Philippians, he says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content in any circumstance. I've experienced times of need and times of abundance. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of contentment. Um, I'm able to do all things. So he learned to be content in whatever circumstance he was in. Part of that, I think, is because he knew this, what he wrote to the Romans was true, that all things work together for the good of those who love God and according, according to his purpose. And so I think Paul saw every circumstance, whatever situation he was in, he knew he was where God wanted him, and that it was an opportunity to share the gospel. And so I think he probably saw coming to Rome in chains. Like, yeah, anyway, it's just another opportunity. And he actually says when he writes to the Philippians from Rome, he says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that my situation has actually turned out to advance the gospel. The whole imperial guard and everyone else knows that I am in prison for the sake of Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having confidence in the Lord because of my imprisonment, now more than ever dare to speak the word fearlessly. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do so from love, but because they know that I am in placed here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, because they think they can cause trouble for me in my imprisonment. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is being proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Joy. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. And then Paul finished this chapter with a benediction, a blessing. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Basically, peace. Shalom. Which then brings us to chapter 16, which is a funny chapter. It kind of reminds me of like a, um, you know, like an award speech where you have to try to remember everybody and thank everybody. It's kind of like that. It's just all these names. Um, but I think it does make an important point, a couple of important points. Firstly, we think of Paul as this amazing person who did all these amazing things for God, and that's true, but he didn't do it alone, right? There were all these ordinary people that God had around him to, to help him, to help him, yeah, and to do that work with him, um, which is quite encouraging. People like you and me that Paul used to support Paul and that God used to support Paul and to build his kingdom. Um, and the other thing is, like, Paul knew some of those people who God had used to help him. And we know some of them because he wrote their names down. But the fact is, God knows everybody who he's used to build his kingdom, right? And, uh, yeah, every single name and all their efforts, our efforts, won't be in vain. God says each will receive his reward according to his work. Now, there are a couple of things that are quite interesting about, or quite cool, I think, about these, um, these names. Of the 24 names that are listed, 13, we found, there, we found 13 of them in, on inscriptions and documents and things from ancient Rome, which I think is kind of cool. Um, Yeah, we don't know that 
all of those inscriptions are necessarily always speaking about the same people, although a lot of them, I think, are. Um, but what we do know is that there were apparently believers within Caesar's household. In Philippians, Paul writes, Give greetings to all the saints in Jesus Christ. The brothers with, with me here, he's in Rome, in prison, um, send greetings. All the saints greet you, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. And so many of the people that Paul greets here in chapter 16 um, were to be, a, to be of the household could be a servant or a slave that belonged to that household or a family member. And so, uh, yeah, some of the people that Paul is greeting here may have been servants of Emperor Nero um, or else servants, family members, yeah. The other thing that's quite cool is that of the 27 people that are listed, at least nine of them are women, which is kind of cool. It's like a third of them, um, which is quite cool as well. And the first, the first one is the first one, Phoebe. Paul says, I commend to you my sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church in Centria, so that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and provide her with whatever help she may need from you. For she has been a great help to many, including me. I wanted to find a picture of like Phoebe Buffet, dressed as a, a Greek or a Roman, but I couldn't. So anyway, the name apparently is pronounced Phoebe, but it means bright or radiant, which is cool. And the word that's translated servant here, it's actually diakonos, diakonos, something like that. It's the word that's used, it's, that is the word that we translate deacon in later passages, which is a, one of the leaders in a local church. So we don't know if like she was formally a deacon of the church, uh, but regardless, she was apparently important enough that um, she was described that way of the church in a little village called Centria, which served as an important port for the city of Corinth. It was just like it would be within that circle there. So I couldn't put them both on there. But she's basically living just outside of Corinth. And that's what, partly why we believe that Paul wrote his letter in Corinth. Um, and that he then entrusted his letter to Phoebe, who was apparently going to Rome to take it. And we don't think, it doesn't seem as though there was like a single church in Rome at that time. So Phoebe probably had to take the letter from house church to house church. And Paul asks, like, basically look after her, treat her well, give her whatever she needs. Then Paul sends greetings to Priscilla, to Prisca and Aquila. My fellow workers in Christ Jesus who risked their own necks for my life, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Also greet the church in their house. So these are two that we actually know quite a lot about from some other passage in Acts, which is cool. Paul uses the name Prisca, which is her formal name. Luke uses the name Priscilla, which is like a little Prisca. <laughs> this is like the friendly, like, you know, the familial kind of name. And from Acts, we're told Paul departed Athens and he went to Corinth. And when he arrived in Corinth, he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, which is this area in northern uh, what is now Turkey, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to depart from Rome. Paul approached them and because he worked as the same trade, he stayed with them and worked with them for they were tent makers by trade. And so... You know a little bit about them. He's a Jew from there. She was perhaps a Gentile from Rome at some point, And when Claudius ordered all the Jews out of Rome, and so Priscilla and Aquila moved to Greece and settled in Corinth. And while they're there, Paul arrives, meets them, discovers they're also tent makers. And he's a tent maker. And so he lives with them and works with them while he's in Corinth. Now, this order of Claudius to get everybody out of Rome, it's interesting, there's a, um, a Roman historian called Suetonius, Suetonius, and he wrote that Claudius banished from Rome all the Jews who were continually making disturbances at the instigation of one Christus. And what we think this probably means is like, Suetonius didn't know who Jesus was, but he heard that there was some kind of 
problems in Rome amongst the Jews about this guy called Christus. But, and Christ, well, about this guy called Christus, but Christus was a common name in Rome. And so he thought he was talking about a Roman called Christus, but it's actually this disturbance was around Jesus, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, so he, Claudius said, get lost. Uh, all, the Jews, all the Jews out of Rome, you're causing problems. Um, and so then he meets them in Corinth. Then later in um, Acts, it says, Paul, after staying many more days in Corinth, said farewell to the brothers and sailed away to Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. When they reached Ephesus, Paul left to Priscilla and Aquila behind there. Then he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had arrived at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church at Jerusalem. And then he went down to Antioch. So he left Corinth. He took Priscilla and Aquila with them. He left them in Ephesus and then he went on to Antioch. And then uh, later when Paul is writing his first letter to the church in Corinth, at that point, which I think he was writing from Ephesus, Priscilla and Aquila are still there. And they have a house, a house church in Ephesus. Um, okay. We'll go quickly. Hopefully it won't be too long. Okay. Greet my dear friend. So then he says, greet my dear friend Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Uh, greet Mary. There's lots of Mary, so we have no idea who that is, who has worked very hard for you. Greet Adronicus and Junior, my compatriots and my fellow prisoners. We think that's another husband-wife team. Um, they're well known to the apostles and they were in Christ before me. And then he says, greet Amplius, my dear friend in the Lord. Now, Amplius is an interesting person. Uh, his name apparently implies that at some point he'd been a slave. But in one of the oldest catacombs, so these are like underground tombs in Rome, there's a, they found a tomb with the name Amplius on it. Um, that dates from basically first century of first century AD, so from the time that Amplius was around. The, sem the cemetery belonged to somebody called Flavia Domitila, who was the niece of the emperor at that time, Emperor Domitian. And Roman history tells us that she became a Christian. So you have Emperor Domitian, he has a niece, Flavia, who's obviously very wealthy and important in Rome, she became a Christian. And so, and then Amplius ended up buried in Flavia's catacombs, in her underground tombs. Uh, and so it's, it's possible that they actually knew each other, that this Ampliatus that Paul is writing to knew Flavia. And I found this clipping from a, um, a news article in a, so that's the tomb that they found. It's a terrible picture. I couldn't find a better picture. And uh, a clipping from the Telegraph in Melbourne from 1888 that says, that talks about them having discovered this tomb. And it says that there is no tomb in the catacombs that equals it for the beauty of its adornments and the variety of its pictorial illustrations. The frescoes in the Golden House of Nero and the adornments of the House of Germanicanus in the Palatine are not to be compared, so it is reported, with the symbolic illustrations of the tomb of Amplius, the teacher of Flavia, the beloved of Paul. Okay. Kind of cool. Then he says, Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my good friend Stachys. Greet Apollos, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my compatriot, and greet those in the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. We think Aristobulus and Narcissus were essentially important rulers in Rome and that these households are their servants and that, that belong to them. In fact, it's also possible that Aristobulus and Narcissus, when they died, essentially donated their belongings to the emperor, Nero, and that they then became part of Caesar's household, the slaves, but they would have been identified as these are the Aristobuli slaves, and these are the Narcissi, whatever, slaves, right? The, the ones that had belonged to so-and-so or so-and-so. So that's how they were identified. Then Paul says, greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, laborers in the Lord. And they think that these might have been twins. There's two, two sisters. 
and their names basically are two versions of the same word, which means like delicate, beautiful, uh, yeah, luxurious. Then he says, greet my dear friend Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord, and greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who was also a mother to me. Rufus is an interesting guy. The Gospel of Mark, so the Gospel of Mark was written by John Mark. Well, we believe it was written by John Mark and was recording Peter's Gospel while he was in prison in Rome before he was executed. Okay, so John Mark is writing down what Peter is telling him about the life of Jesus. And he was writing it to the believers in Rome that his audience was the Romans. And John Mark writes, when talking about Jesus' crucifixion, the soldiers forced a passerby to carry his cross, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country. He was the father of Alexander and Rufus. And he says that as though the people who are reading his book all know Alexander and Rufus, right? Now, and they're the sons of Simon who had to carry Jesus' cross up the hill. Yeah? Now, Simon, it's Simon of Cyrene. Cyrene is in Libya, in Africa. Yes? Okay. So that's fine. Rufus is in Rome and he's the son of Simon Cyrene who carried Jesus' cross. But why does Paul say, and also greet his mother who has, was also a mother to me? His mother being Simon's wife. Yes? Rufus's dad's wife. Simon's wife. We get potentially a clue about that in another part of Acts. This is, so this is very early on in Paul's, he's just been saved basically, it's in the early period there. He hasn't started any of his missionary journeys yet. And he's in, a, in Antioch. And it says that Luke writes, these were the prophets and teachers in the church of Antioch. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucian the Syrian, Manaean, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch from childhood, and Saul. And then they laid hands on them, prayed about it, and God said, set Paul and Barnabas this aside for their missionary journeys, right? So then Paul and Barnabas go out. But before Paul started his missionary journeys, he was apparently in Antioch with a guy called Simon the Black. Niger was the Latin word for black. So probably from, or possibly at least from Africa, from maybe Cyrene, maybe. Because he was also hanging out with Lucius, who was from Cyrene. And so it's possible that this Simeon is the Simon from Cyrene who carried Jesus' cross, who then became one of the teachers in Antioch with Paul, when Paul first became a Christian. And it's hypothesized, theorized that maybe Paul lived with them, with his family, Rufus and Alexander, and his wife, who maybe mothered Paul, who was this baby Christian. Uh, it's also suggested that Paul being a Pharisee from perhaps a Pharisaical family, his family might not have been pleased with his decision to become a believer in Jesus and may have disowned him. And so he may have found a new family here with Simon, the guy who carried Jesus' cross, and his sons, Rufus and Alexander. And so, anyway, pure speculation, but maybe. Um, then he says, greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters with them. We think that's like a house church in Rome. Greet Philologos, which means lover of the word. Philo, Logos, which is quite cool. Uh, and then all these other people. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Yeah, we'll skip that. Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, watch out for those who create dissension and obstacles contrary to the teaching that you learn. Avoid them. For these are the kind who do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By their smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of the naive. Your obedience is known to all, and thus I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. The God of peace will quickly crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. So a little bit more exhortation. And again, as far as Paul is concerned, the church in Rome, the believers in Rome, their obedience is known to all. So he's not really reprimanding him in this letter. He's encouraging them and exhorting him. 
A, a, let's get this. Okay. Then Paul says, so he's greeted all of these people from himself. Now he says, Timothy, my fellow work worker, also greets you. So now he's sharing greetings from the people who are with him in Corinth, one of which is Timothy. Don't have time to talk about, but Paul loves Timothy. He's a young guy. Well, he's a young guy, became a Christian very young. Paul met him as a young boy, I think, by an early teenager or at least a late teenager. He was traveling around with Paul, accompanying him on his uh, missionary journeys. And by a young man, probably in his 20s, he became pastor of the church in Ephesus. And that's why Paul writes to him, don't let anybody look down on you because you were young, but set an example for the believers in your speech, conduct, love, faithfulness, and purity. Lucius, Jason, and Sopater also send greetings. And then I, Tertius, who am writing this letter, greet you in the Lord. And so it's fairly common back in those days that you would have a scribe who it's a very good language, can write really nicely to actually do the writing. So you basically dictate to them. And so Tertius, in this case, is Paul's scribe. Uh, particularly for Paul, we think his eyesight might have not have been very good based on some other passages. And so maybe especially needed somebody to write the letter for him. And so now Tertius gets a little bit in there. Also, I want to send some greetings. Um, Gaius, who's the host to me and to the whole church, greets you. And you know, probably have time to go into who Gaius is, but it's another interesting story. And um, he seemed to have been one of the first converts in Corinth, the first people who, yeah, that Paul preached to. And actually, we think he might have owned the house next to the synagogue in in Corinth. And so when the Jews in the synagogue kicked Paul out, he was like, fine, and he went next door and started a church there that's the that's what it seems like and then he talks so we'll just skip there and then he talks about this guy called Eras, erastus the city treasurer and our brother cortis greets you so this is a guy called erastus who's the city treasurer in corinth and interestingly um yeah he's mentioned 1929, just about 100 years ago, archaeolog archaeologists discovered this like old uh, stone uh, slab that was part of a pavement, which bears the inscription, Erastus, in consideration of his adelship, laid this pavement at his own expense. Uh, and so... And an ideal ship basically was becoming the person in charge of all the public buildings in the city. And so we think possibly this guy Erastus, who was a the city treasurer, eventually got promoted to Adil, Adil, I don't know how you pronounce it, person in charge of all the city buildings. And as part of that promotion, he donated a pavement to the city of Corinth, which is recorded in that slab which is kind of cool but i think what's really cool is like these are ordinary people with ordinary jobs right but they were such an important part of what god was doing through paul and, and through yeah through his ministry there which is very encouraging i think then paul says now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of jesus christ according to the revelation of the mystery that has been kept secret for long ages but now is disclosed and through the prophetic scriptures has been made known to all the nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be glory forever. Amen. Which I think is a pretty grand way to finish with this like beautiful benediction, which if we had the time, you could probably spend ages on. Um, but I don't think that's really necessary because Paul is really just summarizing all the things that he's taught in detail through his letter. Uh, and so I think in the, rather just enjoy it for what it is, um, this beautiful declaration of the majestic God, our precious Savior and his glorious gospel. The end. And uh, if you want to see what our study looks like,
this is what we've done, which is pretty cool. Romans is finished. That's all right. Well done. I'll make it through. Like I said, I'm not sure at this stage what we're going to do next year. Um, we don't have youth service again until February. Next week is the Christmas service. So we'll all just be downstairs. And then January won't hold youth because nobody's here. Um, and then, yeah, we'll start off again in February. And we'll see. At this stage, I'm kind of leaning towards doing a short study in Esther. And then we'll see after that. Shall we pray? And then you can go to your parents who are probably like, where are they? Hmm. Well, God, again, I just thank you so, so much for this incredible, incredible book, this letter that Paul wrote. I thank you for Paul and the amazing mind you gave him and the inspiration you gave him to provide for us this incredible explanation of the glorious gift of salvation that, we've, that we all enjoy. Um, I pray that you would help us to remember the things that we've learned, the things that you've taught us through Paul's words, uh, and that you would help us to remain confident in our salvation and to allow you to, uh, to surrender ourselves to your spirit in us and allow you to sanctify us and to make, you more, make us more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.